Praise be Jesus Christ. Welcome back to our Bible study. Let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Come, O Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant that in the same spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Welcome back. We're continuing on with chapter 19 of St. John's Gospel, and then we will cross over into chapter 20. We'll probably spend most of our time in chapter 19. Uh, we just saw the exchange between our Lord and Pilate in chapter 18, and now we are going to finish that exchange between Pilate and our Lord, and then finally uh, we go on to his crucifixion. So we'll cover that uh, today. So we are here at the site of... Jerusalem. We're at the site of the crucifixion. Uh, behind me you have the temple and then also there is the fortress Antonina. So you can see over here there's the fortress Antonina and then down a little further back this way you see this little gate where I'm pointing. There's a little gate there and that's the gate through which our Lord passed through and then finally he came this way and here where my finger is pointing now you see the stone of Golgotha just outside the city gate, that little stone mount there. So we'll go into some more pictures in just a moment. I'll take you through a little bit of the Holy Land and then we'll go uh, cover some of the material and then I'll show you a few more pictures and uh, we'll proceed on. So let's, let's delve into this, shall we? Okay. So we're now in chapter 19. We, of course, we have those basic themes that show up here again. Uh, in this chapter in particular, uh, we see uh, a little bit about truth, and then we also have the theme of the hour, sort of an, a new creation. There's creation imagery that's very subtle in here. Um, we're going, also going to see later on in the moment of the piercing of our Lord, we're going to see this image of uh, the water and the water of life coming forth from the side of Christ. So we're going to see that image uh, show up here in the crucifixion as well. Then also we will see the seven sacraments. Remember we've gone through, we saw the six sacraments uh, foreshadowed. We'll, we'll recap those and then we'll see how the seventh sign, which is mentioned early on, however, spoken of and fulfilled in this chapter, the seventh sign, which is our Lord, uh, that sign of the seventh sacrament, which we'll get to in just a moment. Let's take a look at the site here. So here is Jerusalem. Here is Mount Moriah. Here's the Temple Mount. This is how it looks currently. And here you see that famous landmark, the Dome of the Rock, that Muslim shrine. Then you also have some other sites. You have off to the east here, you have Mount Olivet, from which our Lord ascended. You also have Gethsemane here, and this is at the base, you know, near the foot of Mount Olivet, the Garden of Gethsemane. And then across from there, almost equidistant from the place where the temple and the rock stood. So about here where you see the MT, that's about where the temple and the Holy of Holies was. But about equidistant from there you have Golgotha. So it's actually quite neat. This forms a line between these three sites and you also have the Pool of Siloam down here. So it really rather forms a cross and then up here you have the uh, the site of the um, moving of the waters, uh, Beth Bethsaida, right, right here, Bethesda, rather. This Pool of Siloam, Mount Moriah, Gethsemane, it forms sort of a cross. So here is the site of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. We'll get to that later. You can see the names of the seven mountains of Jerusalem, 
uh, that those seven which show up also in the book of the apocalypse seven hilled city Mount Garib, Mount Acre, Mount Raya Golgotha was basically on Mount Garib okay see another view plan of Jerusalem so we can see a little more detail and here's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, I'm sorry, here, and the Dome of the Rock here, the uh, site of the temple, Fortress of Anton Antonia. This is um, where our Lord was condemned by Pilate, and then he carried the cross through here, down into this valley, and then back up hill to Golgotha. What would it have looked like in our Lord's time? Now, there's been a lot of, obviously, construction since then, but this is one depiction of what it might look like. We have the temple. Here we have the Antonia Fortress, where Pontius Pilate was. This is a rather not-to-scale view, but uh, really condensed, especially in this area in here. But uh, they have the, the steps here, the Scala Sancta. These are the steps where um, our Lord walked down carrying the cross and then through the city through the gate. I think this layout is maybe a little bit off because as you saw from the other picture, the, the gate is over on the other side. Uh, we'll see that in a moment. But that this Scala Sancta, let's go to another view here. This is from the model in Jerusalem. And uh, again, here's the Fortress Antonia where uh, Pontius Pilate, his headquarters was, his fortress was. Overlooking, of course, strategically placed, overlooking the temple, because if there was ever going to be a revolt, it was going to start in the temple. So he wanted to have a good bird's eye view of what was going on in the temple. So that's why he had these towers built here right next to the temple. These are the Scala Sancta I was mentioning. The steps, the holy steps, they are now in Rome. They have been moved to the location just outside uh, the Church of St. John Lateran. And then, uh, again, scale we're not sure of but at any rate he came through the city eventually coming through this gate out the city uh, this wall this is going to be a later addition so this part this was outside the city at the time at this wall uh, didn't exist at the time of our lord this one down here near the bottom of the screen um, so this was the outer wall of the city there were there was another wall that split right over here you see uh, to this end uh, however um, uh, that wall didn't uh, didn't exist at the time. Uh, here, our Lord came through, and then over here to Golgotha. So here's Golgotha, at least one uh, depiction of it. And then there was a stone quarry nearby. And again, this is one depiction of what it might have looked like at the time. So this is the view looking towards the east from the west. North is this way, south, okay, and so Golgotha was just west of the city and outside the city walls. Looking the other way, here we are looking from above, from the temple. Here you see the, the house of gold down in the bottom left corner. You ha here you have the Antonia Fortress, the Fortress of Pilate. Again, you see one of the towers, but there were four towers. One of them overlooked directly down into the temple courtyard. It was above. You can't see it. It's off the screen. Uh, but here you have looking again. This is looking towards the west now, looking from the other direction. In other words, this is the view, basically a zoomed-in view from Mount Olivet, very zoomed in. And then you have this gate through which our Lord passed, exiting the city, uh, these were these uh, were not there at the time. These these structures. The city got expanded under Herod, and uh, this is about what it would have looked like during the time of the siege of the city, with all these other houses out here. But he came through this gate, and then, not visible because it's blocked by this tower, would have been the stone, the rock of Golgotha, uh, just on the other side of this wall. What does it look like today? What does Golgotha look like today? This is Golgotha. This is the place in within the church of the Holy Sepulcher, within the sepulcher complex. Um, this is what it looks like uh, today. Here you see the rock, 
there's this glass that you can see on both sides of the altar. And here you have the stone of the rock itself. This is the stone of the Golgotha where the cross was planted. The cross was planted, um, they believe, under this altar. You can actually come and venerate and you can uh, crouch down under this altar and put your arm, you can put about your forearm down into, about a foot down from the level here, and, and you can put your arm down into and touch the stone, which is not visible here, but you can touch this, this stone and the, the, the hole where they believe that the cross was mounted. But this is the stone of, of Golgotha. And, okay, that's what it looks like today. What would it have looked like back then? Another view. Again, here's that tower we saw, the wall of the city. This is east, this is north, south, and west. So Golgotha, we know there was a quarry nearby, stone quarry. And then there was the tomb, not far from Golgotha. And indeed, today, as we'll see in a little bit, we'll get to some more pictures later, but so we can get to the text, but uh, we will see that the whole... Church of the Holy Sepulchre complex is all under one roof now. It was not always that way, but it is now under one uh, roof. But it's not far, as, as sacred scripture says, as we will see in this chapter of St. John's Gospel, that the garden and the tomb was not far away from Golgotha. Interesting that this is a quarry, by the way, nearby, uh, because we have the words that our blessed Lord said uh, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. That quarry was the place nearby, just outside the city walls, where they would go and quarry the stones. In some cases, they would use those stones to build the temple. But that very spot on Golgotha, where our Lord was crucified, had a lot of fissures in the stone. Uh, we, we could see actually uh, one of them perhaps, um, but we, they believe that fissure that we saw in the uh, view of Golgotha was caused by the earthquake that happened. But, uh, but at any rate, there were a lot of fissures. The stone had a lot of cracks in it, and so they, the builders rejected that stone. So the stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone. So quite literally, the builders who were Querying stones for the temple rejected Golgotha because it had these fissures and so it became, however, the cornerstone upon which the church was built, the rock where our Lord was, was crucified. So it's quite beautiful. So let's get to the text of uh, uh, John chapter 19. So we have this discourse going on, carrying over from John 18, where Pilate took our Lord and then scourged him. Then they plated the crown of thorns, put it on his head, purple garment. They came to him, hail king of the Jews. They mocked him and they gave him blows. Now, so this is interesting. Uh, Pilate says something quite contradictory, right? Where he says, behold, I bring him forth unto you that you may know that I find no cause in him. Well, then why did he scourge him? If he found no cause in him, no cause for punishment, why would he have scourged him? But he wants to hopefully incite their pity because he was scourged mercilessly and so he's hoping that their pity would be incited uh, instead their bloodlust was incited and they just wanted him crucified and so he says take him you and crucify him you do it and then uh, they say we have a law and according to the law he ought to die because he made himself the son of god when the Church Fathers comment on this, uh, Father Cornelius Alapide in his commentary mentions this, that Pontius Pilate was superstitious because he believed in many gods, and so when he, when he heard that our Lord claimed to be the Son of God, he could already see that this man had a respect for authority. He, we saw in uh, the chapter previous that he said, you would have no authority of me were it not given to you from above. And so when he hears from the Jews that Jesus had claimed to be son of God. Well, now he's worrying that he is dealing with a deity, you know, in, a deity incarnate as it were. So that's why it says in verse 8, when Pilate therefore heard this saying, he feared the more. He's a bit nervous as to what's going on. And then he says, that's why he brings him into the hall in verse 9. He says, from where are you? From whence are you? You know, yeah. 
Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. And then uh, where he says, Do you not know I have the power to crucify thee or to release thee? And that's, this is where our Lord says, Thou should have no, not have power against me unless it were given thee from above. Therefore he that hath delivered me to thee hath the greater sin. Uh, sometimes we hear that uh, all sin is iniquity. And that is true, all sin is iniquity, but there are degrees of sin. So the ones who handed our blessed Lord over to Pontius Pilate had the greater sin. They both wanted him in the end killed, but Pontius Pilate was almost, in a certain sense, he felt forced into it. I'm not saying that he was actually forced, but because he could have released him. But, uh, but he says he has the greater sin, the one who handed over uh, our Lord over to them. And then look at verse 12. So here once again it says, From henceforth Pilate sought to release him, because he sees that our Lord respects authority. You would have no authority over me were it not given to you from above. Pilate acknowledges that respect and he wants to release him. He realizes that he is being uh, coerced. But then they get him with this friend of Caesar issue. If thou release this man, thou art not Caesar's uh, friend. For whoever makes himself a king speaks against um, Caesar. And then he brought him to uh, Lithostrotos, in Hebrew called Gabatha, which is the place of the stones. Um, it's, you can actually still see those stones today, uh, the, the flags, they're very, very large uh, stones, uh, yeah, huge uh, flagstones, if you want to call them that, that make up the floor of this place. And that's what it was named after, Lithostrotos, the, the, um, the, the place of the, the stone floor. Um, you can see that lith litho root, you know, stone, right? And so this is the place of the stones. And those stones are still there today. There's a church at the site of the flagellation of our Lord and the condemnation of our Lord. And I was uh, very fortunate to offer Holy Mass at that church. And you can see the stones still there that were at the, uh, at the judgment seat of uh, Pilate and uh, St. John even takes note of it. They were so large that when they destroyed the temple, they just did not remove those stones. So they, they knocked everything flat when Titus just destroyed Jerusalem. Uh, they still left those stones there. And it was the perceive of the Pasch about the sixth hour. Okay, so this was the perceive of the Pasch. So this was the, the Passover. Uh, now, uh, there are those um, different thoughts out there of when the Passover took place. It had been celebrated the night before by our Lord, but this was the parasy of the, the day of preparation, so a day of preparation for the Sabbath that took place within the uh, Passover octave. That's how some interpret that. So um, there's various interpretations. Some people say that our Lord celebrated it a day early, and the, the actual parasy was actually going to be the, the parasy for the the day of preparation, that's what it means for, for, the, uh, uh, for the Passover, which was going to begin that night. So there's, there's different interpretations of that. So Pilate brings him out, says, Behold your king. They say, Away with him. We have no king but Caesar, right? Shall I crucify your king? The pre chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Um, I want to take you to a verse in sacred scripture that uh, reminds us of this uh, moment, a predicted moment back in Genesis 49, as it were. So let's take a look at that verse. Genesis 49, verse 10, the scepter, the reign, shall not be taken away from Judah, nor a ruler from his thigh, till he come that is to be sent, and he shall be the expectation of nations. So the scepter shall not be taken away. Some have interpreted this passage where they say we have no king but Caesar as, well, now this was the moment that the scepter was taken away. That is, those who had jurisdiction, jus juris dicere, the right to speak, the chief priests, publicly declared before the public magistrate, we have no king but Caesar. They are repudiating in a public way like had never been done before, they are repudi repudiating the rule of God. The scepter was taken then from them. So this is what's, how some have interpreted this, uh, this passage. You'll not get every church father to always agree with every single uh, detail uh, in most cases. So um, you take that for what it's worth. But there's also another passage in Hosea. Let's take a look at that one. Um, 
So it begins with Hosea chapter 10, verse 1 through 3. So we're looking at verse 1 right now. Israel is a vine. Remember our Lord said, I am the vine, you're the branches. And also remember our Lord compared Israel to the vineyard. And he speaks about when the stewards of the vineyard, are they, they're beating the, the, uh, the other uh, servants there. And then finally, when they see the sun coming, those people who are keeping the vineyard, they see the sun of the owner of the vineyard coming, and they say, there's the son, there's the heir. Let us kill him, and the, and the vineyard shall be ours. The inheritance shall be ours. And then they cast him outside the vineyard, just like our Lord was cast outside the city, and he was killed. So Israel is a vine, as we see in uh, here also in Hosea. In your Bible, it might be Ho, uh, O.C. That's sometimes how it's written, without the H, O.C., or Hosea. Israel is a vine. He hath multiplied altars according to the plenty of his hand. He hath abounded with idols. That's not good. So Israel hath abounded with idols. Speaking of Israel, continuing on, their heart is divided and now they shall perish. He, that is God, shall break down their idols. He shall destroy their altars. God shall destroy their altars. Now look at this line. For now they shall say, we have no king. Just like a direct quote, we have no king but Caesar. We have no king because we fear not the Lord. So when they admitted we have no king but Caesar, they are really fulfilling what Hosea 10 verse 3 said. We have no king, but the reason is given because we fear not the Lord. That's a horrible, horrible thing. So they fear not the Lord, and so they have no king as they admitted. We have no king uh, but Caesar. So then they took our blessed Lord uh, to be crucified. They took him away to uh, Calvary. Calvary is simply a uh, Latinized form of Golgotha. It's the same place, Calvary. It's not cavalry. Some people, as usually kids, will make that mistake and they'll call it cavalry, which is, of course, has to do with horses, but Calvary from Calvus, which is skull, Golgotha is skull, the place of the skull, because that is the place where the skull of Adam was buried. I might have mentioned that in a previous class. So there they crucified him with one on either side, Jesus in the midst. And they wrote the title, uh, Titulum, that they put over the head of our blessed Lord, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. So these are the three languages that God Three languages that God chose to have Christ proclaimed king with when no one else would. When they all rejected him as king, God had the declaration that he is king proclaimed in three languages, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. And in the Latin Mass, these are the three languages that we preserve. Hebrew, because we have words like Alleluia, we have words like Hosanna, we also have words like Amen, these are all Hebrew words that we see in the Mass. Well, even the word Sabaoth, Sabaoth, you know, when we sing the Sanctus, 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 Dominus Deus, Sabaoth. Sabaoth means uh, hosts of hosts, right? Lord God of hosts, Lord God of armies, right? So Sabaoth is a Hebrew word. So we have Hebrew in the Mass. We also have Latin, plenty of Latin in the Mass. What about the Greek? Well, of course, we have the Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, Kyrie eleison. That is Greek, of course, for uh, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. So, likewise in the Latin Mass, these three languages proclaim Christ as King. Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, just as the three languages written over the head of our blessed Lord proclaim Him as, as King. And that's why you see over crucifixes the I-N-R-I that you see. It's actually... Uh, you know, J, but that's how they would write the J. There's really no J in the old Latin, so it's written as an I. I N Jesus Nazarenus. The R I is Rex Judeorum. So the I N R I that you see over every Catholic crucifix is Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. It's a quote from John chapter 19, verse 19. And then, as we saw, that was a public place just outside the gate of the city. And St. John says that this was a public place in John 19, verse 20. 
And he says, many of the Jews re read this because it, the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city. And it was written in the three languages, so the people of different languages, different uh, nationalities could read it since Greek was a common language back then. And then, of course, Latin, the Romans could read it, and then Hebrew. Okay, then... They, when they crucified our Lord, they took his garments, uh, fulfilling what it is written, as it is written in Psalm uh, 21 or uh, 22, depending on how your Bible numbers the Psalms. And so we have this, uh, this prophecy fulfilled of, of our Lord's uh, crucifixion. Uh, Psalm 21 says, They have uh, divided my garments among them. And this is... Uh, Chapter Psalm 21, uh, verse 19. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they cast lots. I am poured out like water, says. Uh, my bones are scattered, yet those bones were not broken. They have pierced my hands and my feet. They have numbered all my bones, verse 17. So Psalm 21 is very much a uh, psalm of the uh, crucified Savior. Now here's an interesting detail that is given here. In uh, John chapter 19 verse 23, we see that this, uh, this outer coat or tunic, depending on how you, your Bible interprets it, this tunic was without seam woven from the top throughout. This is actually describing a similar way to which the high priest's vestment was made. It was without seam woven from top to bottom. We see this in Exodus 28, verse 31 and 32. It was also not to be torn. It was not to be torn. And so when Caiaphas rent his garments, that's a violation of the law, but in a certain sense, at that point, he's almost saying, I'm not high priest anymore. <laughs> the high priesthood is now being fill, fulfilled by our blessed Lord, who is also wearing a seamless garment woven from the top to the bottom throughout, uh, as Exodus 28, 31, and 32 describe. And so now here we're, we're seeing some of the priestly aspect of our blessed Lord because he's wearing a tunic just like that high priest was to wear whenever he offered sacrifice. And so our Lord on the cross is, as it were, on a certain altar. And that's where we get to a fulfillment of these, uh, these seven signs. Remember we saw the different signs before. And you remember our Lord promised this one that we're seeing fulfilled now in John 19 as a fulfillment of the sign. The last sign, the seventh sign, that points to the seventh sign. Uh, sacrament. So, if you recall, our blessed Lord says in John chapter 2, uh, verse 18, when he went to purge out the temple, again, he's doing a priestly act. It was the high priest who would cleanse the, the high altar. Our Lord goes in, cleanses the temple. He purges out the temple, drives out the money changers. And then the Jews, therefore, asked, they said to him, what sign Dost thou show unto us, seeing that thou dost these things? What sign dost thou show? And remember how St. John, in any one of the miracles he lists in his gospel, he describes them as signs, as signs. They are signs because they point to something else. And we've seen, we'll review those in a second, but we've seen how the six previous ones we've talked about are foreshadowing one of the seven sacraments. And now here we have this sign. What sign dost thou show unto us, seeing thou dost these things? Jesus answered and said to them, here's his sign, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. That's the sign. Destroying of the temple and the raising up thereof. That's the seventh miracle. That's the seventh sign. The destruction of the temple of his body and its raising up. That's what he promised. What sign dost thou show unto us? Destroy this temple. In three days I will raise it up. So, 
remember here that our Lord is now, he's wearing this, uh, this high priestly garment, as it were, a, a, a linen garment woven from the top down uh, with an opening for uh, the head, uh, no seam in it. And then here our Lord is offering sacrifice, uh, fulfilling what he said he has the power to do by purging out the temple, showing dominion over the temple, which the high priest had. Let's take a look again at those, refresh our memories with the seven miracles that were the seven signs, and we'll see how this last one is fulfilled. So, of course, we had the changing of the water into wine at Cana, John chapter 2, and that points to the sacrament of matrimony. We see also the healing of the ruler's son, John chapter 4, where this uh, ruler's son, at the point of death, our Lord is besought to bring him back from the point of death, points to that sacrament of extreme unction, which in the New Testament we see in James chapter 5, 14. Then we have the healing of the man at Bethsaida, and in John chapter 5, where this points to the sacrament of confirmation, uh, and this is because this is the place where the Spirit moved, troubled the waters, and at the troubling of the waters, that is when the healing took place, moved by the Spirit, kind of points towards confirmation, at which we receive uh, confirmation um, in the, uh, by the mo motion of the Spirit. However, this man at Bethsaida, remember he was alive, he wasn't dead, but yet he was weak, and so he needed this uh, sacrament of um, this healing from our Lord, and that's it's pointing to the sacrament of confirmation. Then, of course, the multiplication of the loaves, John chapter 6, points towards the sacrament of Holy Communion. The healing of the man born blind, John chapter 9, pointing toward the sacrament of baptism, as we saw with all that creation imagery, new life imagery. And then the raising of Lazarus in John 11, pointing to the sacrament of penance, a man who was dead, pointing forward to men, all men who were dead in sin, being brought back to life by the sacrament of penance, which restores a soul to life. And then finally we have this seventh sign, the death and resurrection of our blessed Lord, pointing to the sacrament of holy orders, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. He's also, by saying so, destroying the temple and raising up a new one. In a certain sense, he is saying, I am establishing a new religion, in which indeed he did, fulfilling the old religion and fulfilling it in himself. And so in this way, he points towards the sacrament of holy orders, which is about the exercise of religion and the offering of sacrifice. So we can see there the seven signs of our blessed Lord. Now, here as we proceed into the, the final uh, stages of our Blessed Lord's crucifixion, we're going to point out some things in his crucifixion, which, as St. John writes his gospel, point also to something in chapter 21 of St. John's Apocalypse, or the book of Revelation. There are parallels that we are going to see in these next several verses, that point to other parallels, seven parallels that we see in St. John's account of the crucifixion that point and parallel seven things in uh, Apocalypse Revelation 21. Before we get to, the, the, to those, I just want to remind you, if you have questions, you can submit those on Census Fidelium, and we will answer those at the end of the class uh, once I uh, finish through this, this chapter and get into the next chapter. Okay, so let's let's look at those uh, those references, those uh, seven um, uh, joining crucifixion references. Let, let's take a look. Let's kind of refresh our, our minds as to uh, some of the things that happened. Things, some of the things our Lord said. Remember, our Lord said in John chapter nineteen, verse thirty, uh, "It is finished." Right? And Jesus, when he had taken the vinegar, said, "It is consummated. It is finished." And afterwards, bowing the head, he gave up the ghost. But in Apocalypse 21, we also see this same expression. It is done. Apocalypse 21, verse 6. We also see our Lord say, I thirst. John 19, verse 28. In Apocalypse 21, we see, To him that thirsteth, 
I will give the waters freely. Then on the cross, after our Lord's side was pierced, we see that immediately there came out blood and water. And then in Apocalypse 21, again, see how close these verses are. This is all within that one verse. Apocalypse 21, verse 6. I will give, you know, to him that thirsteth, I will give the fount of the fountain of the water of life freely. And who is the true fountain of the water of life? Well, it's the sacred heart of our Lord Jesus. That is the fountain of the water of life. So you can see how many parallels there are just within these several verses, but there are more. Let's take a look. Now we have our Lord saying in John chapter 19, verse 26 and 27, Woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. In John, I'm sorry, in Re Revelation 21, verse 7, I will be his God and he shall be my son. So this establishing of a relationship is stated here in Apocalypse 21, including sonship. Establishing of a relationship, stating out of a relationship, including sonship. Woman, behold thy son. And then here in Apocalypse 21, verse 7, woman, uh, he shall be my son, I, sh I should say. There are others. Let's take a look. Uh, number six, take a look at number six there. A great voice is heard. Well, a great voice is heard because in Mark chapter 15, verse 37, again, this is not in St. John's Gospel, but St. Mark mentions that our Lord cried out with a loud voice, a great voice. Then we have John 19, verse 27, Behold thy mother. But let's see the parallels again, and especially focusing in on this other detail. Oh, I forgot to mention. Take a look here. The narrative is interrupted here in John chapter 19, verse 35. In John 19, 35, after he sees the blood and water, he says, And he that saw it hath given testimony, and his testimony is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that you also may believe. So here he interrupts his testimony and to specifically state that his testimony is true. But that is exactly what John does in this same set of verses in Revelation 21. He interrupts the narrative and he says that his words are true. Uh, it's, it's, quite, it's quite odd. It's quite unexpected. I mean, he's, here he's been recounting everything. Of course, what he's, what he's recounting is, is expected to be true. But we have this interruption where it says, And he said to me, Write, for these words are most faithful and true. It's a little interruption of the narrative to state that these things that are, he's seeing are true. So now let's get back to... Uh, John 19, and see the parallels again. Because we didn't really talk about this one here. Behold thy mother. How is that paralleled in Apocalypse? Well, in Apocalypse 21, verse 3, we also have a great voice, but we also have, Behold the tabernacle of God with men. So it is interesting, because at the cross, here we have described this Exchange, this whole exchange begins with uh, the words of our Lord when Jesus had seen his mother and the disciple standing whom he loved, he saith to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. After that he saith to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own. And then we have the, uh, the other statements of Things were now accomplished. I thirst. It is consummated. It is finished. Blood and water coming out. The statement that his testimony is true. But notice this behold thy mother is kind of what it all started with here. Behold thy mother. But now in Revelation 21, where there are very many parallels with what we just saw in John 19, we see, Behold the tabernacle of God with men, and it's describing the New Jerusalem. I think St. John is doing this on purpose to set up a parallel between Our Lady and the New Jerusalem. Our Lady as embodying 
the new Jerusalem. This is what St. John is paralleling. I mean, think about it, think about all those parallels that he has. He, and, and think about how many, how close in verses in these are. You know, they're so very close. It's all between John 21, verse 6, and, I'm sorry, Apocalypse 21, verse 6, and uh, Apocalypse 21, verse 3. All right in there. Or, okay, verse 7, I'm becoming a son. So, uh, very tightly compacted, these seven things, which have seven parallels to events at the cross. But this is also to point then, Behold thy mother, but now what are we beholding? Behold the tabernacle of God with men. And just so you don't know, I'm not just drawing this from the New Testament, there's also that in the Old. Okay, remember, this is uh, Apocalypse 21, verse 2 through 3. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from he out of heaven from God as a bride adorned for her husband. And then we have St. Paul picking up the imagery of Jerusalem as a bride and a mother. In Galatians 4, 26, he says, That Jerusalem which is above is free, which is our mother. Uh, it's quite interesting when we take a deeper look at that passage in uh, Galatians 4. Uh, he introduces the whole, the whole issue of uh, free woman, the Jerusalem which is above, which is our mother. He introduces that with this passage in Galatians 4, verse 4, where he says, God sent his son, made or born of a woman. It's odd that he mentions that fact. Of course he was born of a woman. Why would St. Paul mention that here? Well, it's because later in the chapter, the very same chapter, Galatians 4, he's going to set up a discussion about two other women. Well, one woman, Hagar, and then another woman that he leaves unnamed. And of course, in the context, he's first describing Hagar and Sarah. But then he shifts and says, but you are daughters, or you are children, rather, uh, of another daughter, another woman, right? So remember in verse uh, 22, Galatians 4, verse 22, it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he was of the bondwoman, was born according to the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. And he says this is an allegory. These are the two testament, the testaments. And, of course, Hagar was an, an allegory for uh, the Old Testament. But then he says this other woman, well, how is she really an allegory for the, the New Testament? Because she was also under the Old. But it's interesting. He, he shifts his language in verse 26. He says... But that Jerusalem which is above is free, which is our mother. That's not Sarah. I know earlier he was comparing Hagar and Sarah. He doesn't mention Sarah, but he doesn't mention her name. He just leaves her, leaves her woman. But now he says, but that Jerusalem which is above is free. Sarah was not free. Sarah was under the old law. Sarah represented the old law just as much as Hagar did. Even though Sarah was a free woman, yes, we can see how that's an analogy for the new law. She's free. She was not a slave woman like Hagar. However, she was still under the old law. So Sarah is not that heavenly Jerusalem. But he says, that Jerusalem which is above is free, which is our mother. And he says, so brethren, in verse 31, Galatians 4, 31, so brethren, we are not the children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now, he's not talking about Sarah, because like I said, Sarah was still under the old law. So there's another woman he's really speaking of who is free. We are children of the, not of the bondwoman, but of the free woman, by the freedom wherewith Christ has made us free. That free woman, that new Jerusalem, as he said in Galatians 4.26, is that tabernacle of God among men, the bride of Christ, the Blessed Mother, made free from original sin. In this way, she is truly the free woman. Let's take a look again, just so that you know, let's try and settle this a little bit more in our mind. And now, I hope you can see why Catholics make something of a big deal with regards to Our Lady, okay? It's about the freedom of being born again. How can you be born unless you have a mother, okay? We are not a bunch of woke, nonsensical idiots, right? We don't believe in birthing persons. 
right? We believe in mothers. To be born, you have to be born of a mother. That's how it works. You need a mother. So when our Lord says born again, unless you be born again, it doesn't take a, it doesn't take a biology degree to figure out, huh, I got to be born of a woman. And it doesn't take a biology degree to figure out what a woman is, right? So if we are born again, we have to be born of a woman. Who is that woman? It's the woman who was made free, the free woman, as Galatians 4.31 points out. The woman that Galatians 4 verse 4 points out. Christ came into this world born of a woman. Of course he was born of a woman, but he states it at the beginning of this whole thing because she is playing an important role. If we want to be born again, we are born of that woman. Revelation 12 verse 17 also points to this. Huh? I should have been wearing this the whole time maybe. huh? This is my little apologetics point for the night. Uh, I might have others, but at any rate, this is an apologetics point because Our Lady is indeed that woman who we are the children of. She is the one pointed out in Revelation 12, 17, when the dragon was angry at the woman and went to make war with the rest of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So because of this, she is really our mother, okay? She's the mother of anyone who has the testimony of Jesus Christ and keeps the commandments of God according to the Bible, according to Revelation 12, 17. It's not Israel. People say, no, that woman is Israel. He's the child of Israel. Well, no. Uh, Israel wasn't, wasn't persecuted into the desert, had to flee into the desert for the three and a half years, as Revelation 12 describes, the woman who was laboring to give birth to our blessed Lord. That is Our Lady. Okay? Our Lady did flee into the desert, to the desert of Egypt for the protection of her son. And so uh, that, is the, uh, that is the true woman who is spoken of here in Revelation 12. Israel doesn't give testimony to Christ, does it? No, Israel doesn't. Israel rejected Christ. So Israel can't be the mother of the ones who bear testimony to Jesus Christ. So it is indeed uh, Our Lady. Let's take a look then uh, once again at Apocalypse 21. So remember, we saw this already, that behold the tabernacle of God. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God as a bride adorned from her husband. And I heard a great voice from the throne saying, Behold the tabernacle of God with men. Behold thy mother. But also let's look at the Old Testament. The book of Sirach or Ecclesiasticus, chapter 24, verse 12. Then the creator of all things commanded, and said to me, He that made me rested in my tabernacle. He that made me rested in my tabernacle. Who is that speaking of? Who's doing the speaking in prophecy here? This is the Blessed Mother. Because she is saying, He that made me. Well, it's not God. God was not made. God is and existed from all eternity. So this is someone who's doing the speaking who was made and who rested in her tabernacle. Right. I am the and it's the same woman who speaks just a few verses later. I am the mother of fair love. Okay, so we're definitely talking about a woman here. I am the mother, not a birthing person. I am the mother of fair love and of fear and of knowledge and of holy hope. And look what she is also the mother of the one who has in her in me is all grace of the way and of the truth, and in me is all hope of the life and of virtue. We heard that before. I am the way, the truth, and the life. We just saw that in our Blessed Lord's Last Supper discourse in um, John chapter 14, verse 6. But here the speaker in prophecy in Ecclesiasticus 24, verse 24, the one that says, He that made me rested in my tabernacle, she says, I am the mother of fair love, and in me is all grace of the way, the truth, and the life. This can only apply to Our Lady. I'm the mother of fair love. In me is all grace. Only she could say that. That in her was the way, the truth, and the life. The mother of fair love. 
that he that made her rested in her. So that's why that tabernacle then is pointing to our Blessed Lady. So you see, that's what I'm trying to point out here. You see that tabernacle, it is pointing to this mother in whom was the way, the truth, and the life. So this tabernacle then is, this, is an image of this mother. That's why we're saying that when our Lord said, Behold thy mother, there's a line that can be drawn from that to behold the tabernacle of God with men. So, um, it's, uh, it's important. And this was the teaching, this was the belief in uh, the early church, as we will see. Let's take a look at what St. Augustine says on this issue. He says, Plainly, she, Mary, the Blessed Virgin Mary, is the mother of us who are his members, because by love she has cooperated, so that the faithful who are members of that head might be born in the church. So you see, I'm not just making this up. This is early Christian thought. The Blessed Virgin Mary is mother of us who are his members because by love she has cooperated so that the faithful who are members of that head might be born in the church. This is why Our Lady is so important. People think we're taking away from something from God. We are not. We are just explaining the plan that God gave to us. I think every Christian will agree you've got to be born again. But they don't make the next step and say, well, how are you born? Well, you need a mother. You need a father, but you need a mother to be born. You know, He could have just said created anew. He could have just said that, and we could, we could get that. If he wanted to you know, keep this whole mother imagery out of it, he could have said, unless you are a new creation. He speaks elsewhere of us being a new creation. St. Paul speaks like this. But he specifically says born again. And then there's all this other imagery of this mother in uh, Sirach 24, this, the tabernacle, etc. So, okay. Uh, I hope I'm not beating a dead horse at this point, but uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's a significant uh, point because, um, you know, she is really the forerunner for all of us. Uh, and so being the mother of us, being the, the New Jerusalem, the, Jerus the New Jerusalem was in heaven, so we can see that that New Jerusalem was assumed into heaven. The Ark of the Covenant, right? We see that Our Lady is uh, spoken of as the, the Ark of the Covenant. The early Christians spoke of the Blessed Virgin Mary as uh, a new Ark of the Covenant. And do you know that the, the Jews have a tradition that the Old Testament Ark of the Covenant was assumed into heaven? And so uh, we know this from, well, from 2 Maccabees chapter 2, verse 4, we know what happened to the ark. Uh, Jeremiah took it and hid it in Mount Nebo, just outside the Promised Land, um, where, please God, uh, I might be able to visit soon if God spares me. Uh, so we will uh, see Mount Nebo, and there, uh, that's where the ark was hidden. And so we also see... Uh, a woman clothed with the sun. As he sees this imagery in Apocalypse 11, verse 19, and then he sees after describing, after saying that it, there's an ark, and the ark of the testament in this temple, then we see the great sign appeared in heaven, the woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, crown of 12 stars on her head. So as I said, the uh, the... Jews have the custom, the, the tradition that the Ark of the Covenant was assumed into heaven, uh, this place where God dwelt among men, this place where God came down uh, from heaven to be present among the Old Testament Israelites. And so Our Lady as the new Ark of the Covenant is the place where God comes down to, be, to make himself present here among us. Okay, let's get to verse 25. So in John 19, verse 25, we have, uh, we have some people described there. Now, this is an important verse with regards to the um, accounting for the people who are at the foot of the cross. And it also solves that question of the brothers of the Lord brought up in Matthew chapter 13. 
the brothers of the Lord. Who are these brothers of the Lord? We see James and Joseph are described as brothers of the Lord. These are not blood brothers of our Lord, as we can see from this text right here in John chapter 19, verse 25, and a couple of others. We'll see Matthew uh, 27. Let's take a look. So in John 19, verse 25, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary of Cleophas, and Mary Magdalene, John uh, 19, verse 25. Well, Matthew 27 says this, There were many women at the foot of the cross, or present at the crucifixion, among whom was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. So notice, same people being mentioned, okay, Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene, Mary of Cleophas, who is called his mother's sister. That's this Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. Now, we might ask, what about this mother of the sons of Zebedee? So, St. John leaves her out, interestingly. In his humility, St. John leaves her out. Why? Because who is the mother of the sons of Zebedee? It's the mother of St. John. So he didn't say, hey, my mother was there at the foot of the cross. In his humility, he leaves that detail out, that his own mother was also present there, grieving with uh, the Blessed Mother. He leaves that detail out. So St. Matthew, however, includes the detail. The mother of the sons of Zebedee, uh, that is uh, the mother of St. John the Evangelist. So this Mary, who is the mother of James and Joseph, is this his mother's sister. Now, sister is a broad term, as we saw before. We saw in, in uh, Genesis chapter 14 that this term is used broadly to include cousins, nephews even. So the sister, we can't take strictly as blood sister. It can mean cousin. It can mean niece, you know. So uh, his mother's sister, Mary of Cleophas. And then we see that this Mary was the mother of James and Joseph. But it doesn't say the mother of James, Joseph, and Jesus. Don't you think he would have added that detail? That would be an important detail to add if that were really important aspects. So no, this, this other Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, um, is indeed this Mary of Cleophas. And uh, we, we see that, um, uh, you know, included in the list of the uh, apostles, we see that there are these kinsmen of, uh, of the Lord, right? So... Um, we see, for example, in Mark chapter 3, we have the list of the apostles. Uh, and uh, this is where we have the sons of Zebedee again, you know. So, John, I'm sorry, Mark 3, 17, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. And then there was James of Alphaeus, okay, Thaddeus, okay, and then we have... Uh, um, Philip, the brother of James. So these are mentioned in a couple of places, like for example, um, uh, Luke chapter uh, 6, verse uh, 16, describes that, yes, these two were brothers, but they're not described as the uh, blood brothers of our blessed Lord. So, uh, for example, um, James, the son of Alphaeus, Jude, the brother of James, Right, so, and this, uh, this accords with that list that we see of these brothers of the Lord, so-called brothers of the Lord, uh, that we see in uh, Matthew chapter 12, verse um, 47. That's one place. Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without seeking thee. And then in Matthew 13, verse 55, is this not his mother called Mary and his brethren James and Joseph and Simon and Jude. See that same list of people, they keep showing up. James, Joseph, Jude. But you know, it's interesting when we read the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, there's only one chapter in the book of Jude, but anyway, chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, he says there, he introduces himself in this way. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James. He doesn't say the brother of Jesus Christ, right? Because he was a relative of, of him, but he's the blood brother of James, which he mentions that detail, but he says he's the servant of Jesus Christ. So at any rate, uh, that's this, uh, this issue here. 
of the, uh, the women at the cross. Okay, let's get back to this. I said I was going to show you a few more pictures, and then in a few moments we'll, we'll take some questions. So again, here is the, the place, one depiction of it. Now this is what they did with it. So there you see Golgotha. You know, this kind of rocky outcrop. That's how it was. And then they really cut it down. So now there's an altar beneath, and then you have to climb upstairs, and then you can touch the stone up there. But there is an altar underneath. They call it the Chapel of Adam down here. They cut away all this rock. So all this brown looking rock that you see, all that was cut away, leaving behind just what you see, the black there. So they cut away all this, the cave. So here's the antechamber. And uh, that actually is still, um, still part of it. Basically, they still have the antechamber uh, in Christ's tomb. And so this was a, a slope. Remember I said Mount Garab? This is all part of, uh, there was Golgotha, the place of the skull, but um, Mount, we call it Mount Calvary, you know, but this is all part of Mount Garab, who, which was just outside of the city. And this was all cut away. They just knocked all the stone away, except they basically they left the cave. They didn't knock the cave away. They left the cave, and then they removed the top. So that's really what was enclosed. And... We'll get another view of that here. So again, here is Golgotha. Remember the quarry. Then they cut away all this, and now you can see the footprint of the, uh, mostly the footprint of the current cathedral, or uh, basilica, Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And they left the cave. They cut away all the other mountain. They left the, 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 uh, the tomb there. Okay. And this is the layout of it now. So you can see it is very close. Uh, so here is the, the place of the crucifixion, Golgotha. These are the steps going up to Golgotha. And then down here, there's the stone of the unction. So this is where uh, our Lord was laid to be anointed. And then he was carried over here to the sepulcher. So like I said, they kept... The, the cave, they just cut away all the stone around it. And what it looks like today, this area of the sepulcher looks like this today. So they've sort of built up this little, little ch chapel, as it were, enclosing the cave, the tomb. You enter from this side, and uh, there's an antechamber, and then under this cupola is where... The tomb is so I was hoping to get into chapter 20 we might still be able to get into a little bit um, let's just get to actually let's let's back up let's uh, instead of going into chapter 20 uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the burial of our blessed Lord it's very interesting as the chapter uh, 19 closes we see that Joseph of Arimathea is present there. Remember, of course, um, when our Lord was crucified, they pierced his side to make sure he was dead. They didn't break his legs uh, because um, they were fulfilling the, uh, the prophecy that thou shalt not break uh, a, stone, a bone of him, rather. Uh, and so that was from Exodus 12, 46. So it's pointing to the Paschal lamb. It's also the fact that they put the uh, vinegar, the wine, on a piece of hyssop. The hyssop was used to take the blood of the Paschal lamb and mark the lintels of the doorposts of the Jews at the Passover. And so this hyssop shows up again here at the crucifixion. All these Passover, all this Passover imagery pointing back to the Passover, and that our Lord is the new Passover. And that's why St. Paul says, Christ, our Passover, our Pasch, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us feast with the, the new leaven. So it's a new covenant. And so they broke the legs of the thieves, but they didn't break the legs of our Lord, fulfilling what was in Exodus 12, 46, that would, they would not break a bone of the lamb, the Paschal lamb, and so then the blood and water came out. It's very interesting because uh, this water coming out of the side of Christ is um, 
uh, pointing towards uh, the the the, uh, the supplying of the of the water in the desert to the Israelites. And why do I say that? Well, remember in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, we see in those first several verses of that chapter, we see that the rock that provided them the water in the desert was Christ by allegory. St. Paul says that uh, the, they all drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Remember, the stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone. The rock was Christ, and so the water flowed from the rock. They all drank from the rock, as 1 Corinthians 10 says, and so now our Lord's side is pierced, and the water flows out once again from the rock, who is Christ. But we see that not only did water flow out, but blood and water flowed out. In Numbers chapter 20, verse 11, we see that when, they, when Moses struck the rock, water flowed out. But you know, there's actually a Jewish writing, the Targum. The Targum is um, a Jewish writing that adds more detail to what is in the Old Testament. And so now here, this is the testimony of Jews. This is not the testimony of Christians trying to uh, pull off a, a Christian fast one or anything like that. These are Jews who are writing the Targum. And in the Targum, it says that when Moses struck the rock in the desert, the Targum says that blood and water flowed out. Isn't that fascinating? A Jewish witness, as it were, in this Jewish writing, says that blood and water flowed out from the rock. And so it is pointing forward in, un, in unwittingly. It's pointing forward to what happened right here in the fulfillment of the whole Old Testament, uh, our blessed Lord. Uh, there's, uh, there's other verses I can point you to if we have time uh, that might shed a little bit more light on this as well. Uh, remember in uh, the Book of Wisdom, there is a little recounting of the, the events in the Exodus, and it talks about how God uh, led them through. Uh, so in Wisdom 11, um, he says, 11 verse 5, he says, By what things their enemies were punished, Israel was fed. So, uh, just to back up a little bit, in Wisdom 11, he's recounting how God led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. And so, it talks about how the victory was accomplished, you know, and it says they went through the wilderness, and they were preserved, they were thirsty, and they called upon thee, and water was given to them out of a high rock, and a refreshment of their thirst out of the hard stone. And he says, for by what things their enemies were punished when their drink failed them, the children of Israel abounded therewith and rejoiced. Well, what was, is, what was Egypt punished with, with regards to the water? It was that it turned to blood. And so in Wisdom 11, verse 5, it's alluding to this as well, that there's this blood and water. So by what things that the Egyptians were punished? The Israelites abounded, right? But what, by what things their enemies were punished when their drink failed them? While the Israel, uh, well, Israel abounded therewith and rejoiced, by the same things they in their need were benefited. So by the same things that their enemies were punished with, that is blood, that's what they were punished with, their water turned to blood. By what things the enemies were punished, by the same things the Israelites in their need were benefited. So there's this really vague, but it is an allusion to this fact of this blood and water connection. Uh, Egyptians were punished with blood, and the Wisdom 11, verse 5 and 6 are saying, by the very same things that the Egyptians were punished with, blood, the Israelites benefited. So it seems to allude that there's this blood that turned to water, or something like that, which is why the Targum mentions this little detail, that blood and water came from the side of the rock that Moses struck. It's quite interesting. It's very, very interesting. Um, and in fact, it gets a little more explicit in verse 7, Wisdom 11, verse 7. For instead of a fountain of an ever-running river, thou gavest human blood to the unjust. All right, so that was the Egyptians, right? But 
It's interesting how it says by what things they were punished, the Israelites were benefited. You know, and uh, so it's quite interesting that there's that connection. Again, not a very clear line, but then when you add the Targum detail that blood and water flowed out, and then when you add the crucifixion where blood and water flowed from the side of Christ, who is the rock, we see the lines all connected together. There's a beautiful foreshadow then what happened to the Israelites when the water and according to the Jews and the Targum, blood flowed out. It was fulfilled in Christ. Why did this water flow out? Well, the same reason it flow, flowed out for the Israelites, to give them life. And so we receive life from the side of Christ. And then, of course, uh, Joseph of Arimathea took our Lord and buried him in, uh, in this newly hewn uh, stone uh, cave, sepulcher. It's interesting that at the birth of our Lord, there was a Joseph, and at the death of our Lord, there was a Joseph. And so Joseph of Arimathea takes the body of our Lord, takes custody, takes charge of and care of the body of our Lord, just as at the birth Joseph, St. Joseph, had custody and charge and care over our Lord, come in the flesh. And like our Lord, had to be buried, as it were, in, uh, in a cave. That's what the manger was. It's a hole in the stone. That's what the manger was. They, they kept these animals in this cave, and that was the manger. Well, so our Lord ends up in a cave once again at his death in this tomb. There's the mention of the garden in verse 41. Now, in the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. So, our Lord then is fulfilling this as the, uh, as the new Adam, as 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22 through 26 describes our blessed Lord as. Our Lord is the new Adam, and so there's a new garden where he begins his life, as it were. Um, Adam the first Adam was placed into a deep sleep. His side was opened. From that side, Eve came forth. And so our Lord Jesus, in another garden, as a new Adam, he was placed into the deep sleep of the death. His side was opened with the spear, the lance. And from that side, the church, the bride of Christ, came forth. It's quite beautiful uh, how God brings all things, uh, all things together into a conclusion. Well, okay, looks like we're not going to get into chapter uh, 20 today. We were ready for that, but uh, we're going to try and answer any questions which may have come in. Okay. okay. So, uh, again, those questions uh, are, those are submitted on census fidelium and... Uh, We'll see what we have here. Okay. Okay, what is the meaning behind the unleavened bread? And can you tell us a little bit about Pontius Pilate's wife? Okay, two-part question there. Meaning behind the unleavened bread. So the unleavened bread, it was unleavened. First, the historical context, that's from Exodus 12. The historical context is that because they were in a rush to get out of Egypt, once uh, the Pharaoh kicked them out, then they, they didn't have time to let their bread rise, so their bread was unleavened. And that was the historical context of the unleavened bread. Uh, because they were going to be eating it in haste, as God commanded them to do uh, in Exodus 12. They were Because they were on a journey, they were going to be moving very quickly, very soon, so that they could head out, so they didn't have time to l let their bread rise, so there was no leaven. Now, also that becomes an analogy for something, an allegory for it, if you will. So we have the little leaven corrupteth the whole lump, right? So leaven sort of artificially, cre you know, creates uh, height to the bread, you know, it's, it's, it's air, right? Or it's where I guess the gases from the, um, you know, from the uh, microbes that are in there. So, uh, but that is sort of an artificial inflating, as it were, of the bread. It may, you know, takes, makes it taste, be taste better, but it's, so it's a little more penitential to eat the unleavened bread because it doesn't have that, that light, fluffy texture that leavened bread has. So there's an aspect of penance to unleavened bread. And also, 
they, you know, because what leaven is, right, it's these things in the air that settle on the bread and then, you know, cause it to rise. And so there's a certain sense of this corruption where this outside thing comes in and corrupts, as it were. You know, people actually put the leaven themselves in the bread. But, uh, but you know, symbolically, there is a, an aspect of corruption. It's not pure wheat and water. Okay, that's what's behind that, that it's not pure wheat and water. So... The sacrifice that was offered at the Passover had to be unleavened because it had to be purified. You had to get rid of the leaven from the home. After the Passover that happened with Moses, when they commemorate that every year, they had to purge their homes of leaven, symbolic of them purging out that which was evil, that which was, um, which like pride rises and swells up in our soul like leaven causes things to swell up. We have to get rid of pride, right? And so, and in humility, eat the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. It's just sincere, pure wheat and water. So that is why there's that um, that analogy, that uh, foreshadow. So the feast of unleavened bread, right? The beginning of their year, that would be with the feast of unleavened bread and the pe- feast of Passover. Well, the final feast of their liturgical year uh, would be a harvest feast. Uh, but I'm, I'm sorry, not the final one, but I'm thinking of the, the, the Feast of Pentecost. Fifty days later, it, it was a harvest feast. And in that sacrifice, as we read from Levit- Leviticus 23, they did use leaven. That was the one sacrifice that they did have leaven. But that's because that symbolized the harvest at the end of time. The harvest at the end of time in which the Gentiles would also be added. So the leaven becomes a symbol of the Gentiles, the addition of the Gentiles. And so that sacrifice at Pentecost, 50 days after the Passover, that did have leaven in it, as you can read in uh, Leviticus 23. I don't recall the verse itself, but it's in Leviticus 23. And that has leaven, so it's symbolizing the Gentiles. So that's what the symbolism is with the unleavened bread. Uh, Pontius Pilate's wife, uh, I don't know a lot about that other than the warning that she was giving her husband. She suffered a lot of things in a dream. Uh, by him, um, you know, th- there's a there's a, a tradition that she would hear re- in the in this dream. She heard repeated the words echoing throughout history. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and that's what was causing her to suffer. And as this as though this were some prophecy, little did she know she was foretelling the Nicene Creed, which would be echoed and said throughout all the centuries since, uh, since the Council of Nicaea. So that is, that's about all I know about uh, Pontius Pilate's wife, so maybe there's others who can chime in and maybe put some comments that maybe know what happened to Pontius Pilate's wife. Okay, we talk a little bit about the water from the side of Christ and the water always pointing to the Holy Ghost in Scripture, if that applies. Yes, so it's interesting, the water from the side of Christ and pointing, and the water pointing to the Holy Spirit in Scripture. Yes, so the, the water, there's always that close connection between the water and, this, and the, uh, the Spirit. Remember, our Lord said this in John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38, where he says, Those who believe in me, out of his very heart shall flow rivers of living water. This he said of the Spirit that he was to give. So yes, out of his very heart, of our blessed Lord's very heart, there flowed a river of living water. And this was spoken of as of the Spirit. We also see in Revelation 22 that uh, in verse 1 and following, that the, the Holy Ghost, symbolized by this river of living water, that same river of living water that we saw in John 7, 37, this flows out and proceeds from the throne of God, the Father, and of the Lamb. So it's proceeding from the Lamb as well as the Father, just like the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son. A little apologetics for those who may not be... Uh, for the Orthodox, right? So anyway, uh, yes, the Son also um, uh, brings forth, as it were, the, the Holy Ghost. And so when our Lord is crucified, this blood and water flowing forth is, yes, it is pointing towards the, the Holy Ghost. Uh, flowing from, proceeding from, as he said he would just a couple of uh, chapters before in John 16. Remember, he says that he will give the Spirit, you know, 
He says, when I go, I will send the Spirit to you. When he's going, he says, it is finished. He's being consummated on the cross, and then he's going to send forth the Spirit. So this is symbolized by the water. There was actual water flowing from the Lord's side, but it's a symbol of the Holy Ghost. It's a type of the Holy Ghost, as it were. So, yes, uh, good question. And, of course, keep in mind that at every Holy Mass, the priest adds just a little bit of water to the wine before it is transformed, changed into the body of our blessed Lord. At that point, that water symbolizes us, because if you notice the Deus Cui Humani Substantiae prayer that the priest says at that point, um, who, our Lord who has uh, wonderfully redeemed, uh, has won wonderfully created us and still more wonderfully redeemed us, you know, grant by the, this commingling of the water and wine, we may we be made partakers of Christ, who um, has made um, uh, uh, partakers with us, you know, has become man for us. And uh, that's a kind of a condensed version of that prayer. But that so the water, the commingling of the water and the wine is a symbol of our being joined to Christ. Christ being symbolized by the wine, which is then changed into his blood. And then us being added to Christ, the water being, uh, you know, the, wa the wine is a more noble thing. Right? And the, uh, the water then is transformed and inseparable from the wine, and that is what is transformed into the, the body and blood of our blessed Lord. So what is meant by the great Sabbath day? Well, that was because it was the Sabbath day that fell within the octave of the Passover. That was a great Sabbath day. Okay. So, and our Lord suffered on that day, that specific day was, it was also, it was March 25th, it was the day he was conceived, and so he died on the day that he, he came into this world. So that was the significance, uh, the significance of that. And when a Passover, because the Passover always happened on the 14th of Nisan, when that happened to fall on a Sabbath day, they would call it a great Sabbath day. So it was just, it just heightened the solemnity of that Passover when it fell on what we would call a Sunday, right? But it was, it was the Saturday, but it was it fell on their Sabbath day, their their holy day, right? Okay. So let's see, uh, Father, should we understand that all the sacraments were already in place in the church before John wrote his gospel? Yes, we should un understand that. We do believe that the Apocalypse was the last book written in the New Testament. And the sacraments were in place, as we see, you know, an example of that I cited earlier, James 5.14, where he says that the um, is any man sick among you, let him bring in the priests of the church and let him anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick man. It's pointing to extreme unction. Um, you might know it by the sacrament of anointing of the sick. And uh, so that is pointing to that. The sacraments were indeed in place. Remember that a sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. Our Lord instituted those seven sacraments. Uh, some he instituted in forma specifica, as we say in Latin, that is a specific form. Bread and wine, you know, water for baptism, specific form. Others, it's not as specific. In other words, there is a sacrament of matrimony, but we don't have a specific form given as to how that comes about. And so the church has a certain, you know, they can set a right for bringing about a matrimony, and that right can be adapted or whatnot over time. But, um, so, but the sacraments were in place, though. That's the key thing. They were instituted by Christ. They were all instituted by Christ, all seven. But the form might have been uh, adapted words or other symbols added to them, just like those sacramentals that are added to prepare the baby to receive the sacrament of baptism, which that sacrament actually just takes place at the pouring on of the water, but those other sacramentals were added to it by the church. Okay, so is the rock a symbol of Jesus, but then Jesus called Peter the rock upon which he would build his church, so is Peter then Jesus' successor? Well, we call our Lord um, the rock, as he is indeed the rock, right? And we see that from the Psalms. And we see that from 1 Corinthians 10, as I just pointed out earlier. And so Christ indeed is the rock. But when our Lord calls Peter the rock, he is basically saying to him that he is like a son. Because the two, a son shares a similar nature, well, the same nature, I mean, human nature is in a human generation. The son shares the same nature as his father. 
And so when one is called a son, that means there's, there's an equality of nature. And so Peter, not, not, say, not saying that Peter is divine, but he's making him, he, he's putting something, Christ is putting something of himself into Peter. So by calling Peter the rock, Kephas, he is truly calling him what our Lord is. Right? And so he is making, he's elevating Peter to the status of being a vicar of Christ who acts in the place of Christ. So the successor of Christ, I probably wouldn't use that terminology, but it's close that he's the vicar, he acts in the place of Christ. Whatever you declare bound on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you declare loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven, as we see from Matthew 16, uh, verse 17, 18. Uh, and of course, we know that... Uh, uh, our Lord uh, is foreshadowed by Jonah, uh, as we saw in Matthew 12, and also in uh, the book of Jonah, chapter 2. There's some parallels with, with Jonah and our Lord. And then our Lord says to Peter in Matthew 16, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of Jonah. So he's saying to Peter, you are like my son, because our Lord compared himself to Jonah earlier, and then now he calls Simon, son of Jonah. Right. And by the way, there's no there's no distinction between rock, little rock, and big rock. There's that whole thing of like, oh well, Peter's this little rock because he said Petros, which can mean little rock, and Petra means big rock, and this whole false distinction. It's not true. First of all, that's not what our Lord called him. He didn't say Petros. He said Kephas. We have it from we have it recorded what he actually said in St. John's Gospel, as you may recall. Back at the beginning, uh, was it John chapter 2, I believe? Yeah, so John chapter 1, I'm sorry, uh, verse 42, where he says, Thou art Simon, son of John, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is interpreted Peter or Petros. In other words, he called him Cephas. He didn't call him Petros. And then John gives the interpretation in the Greek. Some people who are trying to lower the status of Peter as, you know, not, he's not the first pope, that kind of thing, they will say, oh no, he's using this other term and it means something different. But that's not the term our Lord used. He used kephas. And in the Aramaic, that's Aramaic for rock, in the Aramaic it reads, you are kephas and upon this kephas I will build my church. It's identical. There's no distinction between little rock, big rock, that sort of thing. So, okay. Was the Roman soldier converted by witnessing water coming from his side with blood? He was, actually, and that is St. Longinus. He did convert. He became a Christian, and he is a martyr as well. Um, why would the Jews say they have no king when they had Herod? Yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, at that point, they were going to say just about anything to get our Lord crucified. Because, in fact, remember what they found our Lord guilty of? wasn't because he claimed to be king. They found him guilty of blasphemy, according to them, because he, when he said, art, art thou the Christ, the Son of the blessed God? And our Lord said, Ego eimi, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man coming on the power, um, sitting at the right hand of the power of God, coming on the clouds of heaven. He's alluding to Daniel 7, where he's making this divine claim, this a statement of divinity. So they thought this was blasphemy, and it would have been blasphemy if he was not actually God, but he is God, so it's not blasphemy. So that's what they found him guilty of, but then they accused him to Pilate of subverting the people. He claims to be a king, you know, but it wasn't of blasphemy, right? And so at that point, they were going to say anything, basically, to get him crucified. So it's true, they did have Herod, but they were just trying to ingratiate themselves to Pontius Pilate, saying what they thought he might want to hear. We have no king but Caesar. See how loyal sons of Caesar we are? So, just shows their viciousness, right? Okay. Um, is the language of Holy Mass supposed to be limited to the languages over the head of our Lord, and why? Well, you know, even the Council of Trent uh, doesn't say that it has to be limited to, you know, it says, is it possible for you to offer, the, you know, the sacrifice, the holy sacrifice of the Mass in a vernacular? You might be surprised to know that the Council of Trent said, yeah, that's certainly possible, but we don't think it's a good idea. We don't think it's a good thing to implement. Because, um, uh, you know, as the saying goes, the, the uh, 
the translation betrays, you know, it sort of betrays the truth when you translate. So, um, so for that reason, the, the church has kept it in the, in the Latin. So it's not that it's supposed to be as in, but like by a divine law. It's just there's a fittingness. That's what I'm saying by the Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. There is a fittingness to have, um, have that be the language of the Mass, right? Um, so, yes, there were some garments that were meant to be torn. That's true. So the question is about the high priest garments. Why was the high priest garments different? Well, because the high priest had a role, a dignity, a role of dignity in among the people, and those vestments were blessed. Those vestments were holy, and so he was not to tear them because of that. So that's why the high priest was not supposed to tear his liturgical vestments, as it were, of which the linen garment woven in one piece was a liturgical garment. And so our Lord, having such a garment woven in one piece, we're seeing that parallel uh, that, yes, this is, uh, this is our Lord acting as a high priest because he's wearing a garment that is like this, not to be, apparently, not torn at all, huh? as the Gospels tell us. Okay. The Gospels describe darkness at the death of our Lord. Is there evidence from astronomy or from other historical sources that this occurred outside of the Holy Land? Yes, there is. So, in Heliopolis, down in North Africa, they saw, there were people who witnessed this, what they call the violent movement of the moon. Because remember, the crucifixion happened at the full moon. That's when the Passover took place, near the full moon. Right after the full moon. And so, the sun's over here, full moon, it's over here. Well, in Heliopolis, they saw this movement of the moon moving across the sky, and they were wondering what was happening, and the moon came and blocked the sun for those hours, those three hours, and then it moved back to its normal position. So they wondered what should have happened. There are other places, Asia Minor, that recorded some uh, strange darkness and earthquakes, and they said, what could have happened today except that perhaps a god died on this day? Little did they know that's exactly what happened hundreds and hundreds of miles away down in Palestine. So yes, there are historical sources uh, that show this happened. Um, so um, there's much more we can say on that, but I think we are... Uh, out of time. I can't answer the last question. There's a simple one here. What is the iconographic meaning of the crucifixes with skull and crossbones under our Lord? Okay, the crucifix there with the skull. Okay, that is a sign of Adam because our Lord was crucified over Golgotha, the place of the skull, which is the place where Adam's skull was buried. It's not clear where the rest of his body was or if his, the rest of his body was there, but they know Adam, who is the head of the human race, his skull was buried there, so that's why it's called the place of the skull, and that's why in symbol, the, those things uh, indeed uh, have the, the skull at the foot of the cross in some crucifixes, okay? So it's not to be creepy, it's, uh, it's to show that indeed our Lord was crucified over the place where Adam's skull was, thereby healing all of mankind, beginning even from Adam to the very last sinner that would ever live. Okay, we are out of time, so we will conclude now, and then we will continue next time with the last two chapters of this Holy Gospel. Let's close with the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. And I will give you all a blessing. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti, descendat super vos et maniat semper. Amen. God bless you.